Hello and welcome to another edition of the Stir Crazy Podcast. As always, my name is Rob Nelson. And I'm Mike Bakov. And hey, Rob, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. You know, I tried to uh, tried to stop doing this podcast, but couldn't uh, couldn't quit cold turkey. God. Yeah, it's bad. I mean, <laughs> it's becoming a tradition here and one I am <laughs> begrudgingly accepting. But uh, today we are going to be talking about all things Thanksgiving. In the first half of the podcast, we are going to be joined by the always entertaining Casanova, who is our director of interpretation here at Stern Museum. And then in segment two, we are going to kind of shift gears and speak with the director of the museum, Chris Hochstetler, and the executive director of the Stern Museum Foundation here in Grand Island as well, Bonnie Smith. Yeah, it's it's a very sort of different podcast for us because we're getting a little contemplative, as you tend to do toward the end of the year, as you tend to do in Thanksgiving. And of course, we're going to hit you with a good dose of history. So I, I think the the conversation with our executive directors is a very interesting peek behind the scenes of what it takes to make a museum, especially one the size of Stewart Museum, happen. Yeah, absolutely. It's all going to be gravy. Yeah. All right. Get into it. Welcome back to the Stir Crazy Podcast. This is Rob Nelson. I'm here with Kay Sonova, the Director of Interpretation here at Stir Museum. Kay, it's been a little while. Welcome back to the podcast. Oh, good morning. Glad to be back. Absolutely. I always enjoy talking with Kay during these because we really get into the weeds with history <laughs> more so, I feel, maybe than others might appreciate, but we certainly do. Today, we're going to be talking about all things Thanksgiving and the history of this holiday. Um, the first question we're going to jump into is uh, the re- really the origin story of Thanksgiving. Uh, what is the myth of Thanksgiving? Well, the, we'll start the, there. the story surrounding Thanksgiving is, is always the, the, the Puritans and the celebration with the, the Native Americans in the, the original Plymouth uh, settlement. There's debate. There's heated debate over what foods were served and and all of that, and every year, in fact, we will start seeing those come up pretty soon on on some of the history channels and stuff, the types of foods that would more likely have been served as opposed to the things that we consider traditional uh, these days. Yes, as well as the controversy surrounding the relationship between the Puritans and the um, Wampanoag Native yes. Americans at the time in, in the early 1620s. And Plymouth Plantation does a really good uh, interpretation of some of that aspect uh, and and their their interaction since they are interpreting that particular time period in sight. That is a museum. Yes, it is. It's a living history museum on the the east uh, coast of the United States. It's probably named for the one of two accounts there are of this. Correct. Season of interaction between the natives, the native population and the Puritans. Um, William Bradford, who was one of these original 53 who survived uh, Puritans, who wrote a journal of or an account of of these interactions titled Of Plymouth Plantation. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm, I'm guessing that's where it gets its name. A lot of the traditions that have been associated with Thanksgiving sort of come from one or two of these accounts. Yeah, because there there developed a mythology around the Puritans, and and I remember as a kid making little pilgrim cutout things as a part of a, a class as a grade schooler and things like that. So it's part of that mythology around that particular group and time period. The thing that is probably the most problematic that I feel like gets glossed over, especially in education to the young, in, in America is this kind of, you know, this natural bond that Native Americans had with the pilgrims um, to begin with. That it was not as cut and dry as it's no. been made out at all. So let's talk a little bit about it, that. It was a little more pilgrims, Puritans. They were having a little bit of trouble uh, figuring out uh, how to get things done and how to survive. They had, as with anybody coming to kind of land that they do not know or understand, they were having problems with crops and all that other stuff. And it would not have been without the help of the native tribe in that area that they would not, that they, all of them would not have survived. Yes. I think there were originally 102 Puritans from the Mayflower of those that survived the first winter were 53 in total, I believe. Yeah, so it was a hard hit. Yeah. 
another mis common misconception is that I feel like that they're that this was like a first contact scenario where natives had no knowledge of Europeans at this point, but they did. There actually had been about a hundred years of 120 years of, you know, People European hit, and yeah. Native American Disney. interaction. Yeah, it they were not large events, but there was they knew that others were out there. Yes. They just did not see them on a regular basis. Um, two from the Wampanoag tribe spoke English. So, I mean, right there, you can see that. Yeah, you know that they had to have some serious long-term contact with somebody in order to be able to do that. Yeah, and in the research that I found, it was more that for the Native Americans trying to reach out to the colonists wasn't so much out of the goodness of their hearts. It was more so to kind of build a political alliance with a group to kind of help them in their own political disputes with other Native American tribes. Yeah. Um, so it just gets into the more geopolitical yeah. realm of conversation. Isn't as, that what it's always about? <laughs> yeah. Instead of this, you know, hi, how are you? Oh, we're really, yeah, you we're know, gonna, we're going to be friends. I, exactly. <laughs> um, so that's always a, a thing I, I'd really like to, to kind of hammer home. The term Thanksgiving itself, um, it has a, a lengthy history and as do like these sort of feasts. What, what was Thanksgiving in the 17th century and what like what would people have understood that term as being? Well, I think that it was largely tied to the harvest, to a to a successful harvest. Yeah. Uh, if there, you know, there was always the 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 period of time where you'd survive the winter, you plant your crops and things are maybe not that plentiful. And then you have your harvest and a plentiful harvest and you give thanks for the fact that you have this nice harvest that will hopefully carry you through winter. Originally, especially with settlement groups, they would pool their resources and try to make sure that everybody had enough and all that. But they they, they gave thanks. It's like, yeah, hey, let's have a party because we got a lot of stuff right now. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of did 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 Thanksgiving also have like a like a meaning towards fasting and like a national day of not eating, not national, but like prayer, things associated with prayer and fasting and not so much with food and uh, merriment, if you will. Well, Thanksgiving is, was ba it started out as basically an Eastern or an East coast, Eastern States type of thing. It, it did not develop, it developed into a national thing much later. It was largely unknown in the South. It uh, just kind of evolved. And there was, depending upon your religious orientation, there were different aspects of, of approaching this. There are, uh, we have a photograph in our collection, this is going to be much later time period, of a harvest uh, festival, festival or harvest uh, kind of Thanksgiving decoration in a church with all of these, the, the goods of the harvest are on display in this church. And, and so that's part of that, that Thanksgiving. And um, even in the Grand Island paper in the 1880s, they're talking about the church services associated with the um, Thanksgiving day. So when did the, the current form of Thanksgiving that, you know, Americans celebrate today, when did it sort of take on its it take on a structure that people would recognize it started with a very long campaign by a lady who was the editor of Godey's magazine sarah josepha hale and she had a uh, a long period of time where she communicated with a number of presidents it was five i believe it was uh in order to try to de develop or to to make sure that we would have a national holiday of Thanksgiving. It took 17 years, but she eventually, through President Lincoln, President Lincoln is the one who actually signed it into an official holiday in 1863. That's how it became a holiday. But she also promoted this idea in the Godey's Magazine, and especially with the advent of the Civil War and how it was ripping apart the country, one of the arguments is this is a way to unify it, as to we all come together with a day of thanks. And she continued in her magazines to talk about Thanksgiving, I think for the, the whole term of her editorship. 
Uh, and that's why we have an official holiday. It was only the third holiday, national holiday, that the United States had. Yeah, you mentioned that. We were talking about that before the podcast started. It was, uh, what were the, the first two again? The, the first two, and I do not know in which order, were Washington's birthday and the 4th of July. That's amazing to me that, you know, something like George Washington's birthday, a holiday that, you know, few would even probably recognize on the calendar today would have been the first national holiday or second right after the 4th of July. And also the 4th of July has its own unique oh, yeah. uh, history that's, of not that's really a being whole accurate. Other, <laughs> podcast that's a whole other come. podcast, yes. Um, so we'll take that at a later date. But uh, yeah, that's just a, another tidbit of history that I find really interesting. Yeah, the, you mentioned a little earlier five presidents um, that, you know, Miss Hale tried to lobby to get this as a yeah, national. Yeah, I didn't write da- all of them down, but. Well, fortunately, I did. Oh, of course uh, they you They were uh, <laughs> Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, and then Abraham Lincoln. So presidents 12 through 16 yeah. all had some form of back and forth uh, with Sarah Hale. And there, are, I believe that her letters, her correspondence are probably in the National Archives. I don't. I did not look into that, but I know that there are examples of some of the, uh, her letters, especially with Lincoln, yeah. on the subject. Sarah Josepha Hale has another impact on Thanksgiving and how we celebrate it, and it has to do with turkeys. Yes. Do you want to talk about that, or uh, I can as well? I don't really... I, I did not look into the, because you, you find all of this stuff about the food. I was going to bring one of my period cookbooks that has menus for uh, events like Thanksgiving sure. and things in it. And you run the whole gamut of, of types of uh, food that are in there. We know that, that it was uh, Franklin who wanted to make the turkey the next. The national bird. Yeah, that's another tidbit of history. Yeah. Uh, there was some debate before we landed on the American bald eagle as our national bird. Benjamin Franklin floated the idea of it being the turkey, the, the Thanksgiving style well, turkey. Just think about that for a minute. If that had been the national bird, we wouldn't be eating it for Thanksgiving. Yeah, there you go. What well, might have been? Yeah. So fast forward a little bit to the the time of the you know 1840s, 1850s. Sarah Josepha Hale is reading these two accounts that I mentioned earlier of some of the original colonists um, that they they had left behind of this time in history in the 1620s. After her reading of one of these books by one of by um, by Bradford, she drew attention to this one line, and it's only one line in in this long account, and it just says. And besides waterfowl, there was a great store of wild turkeys of which they took. Uh, okay. And, and from, I've forgotten about that. And from this one line, you know, and it goes on after that to say there were also many venison and other things and yada, yada, yada. But Well, and in their examination of some of the foods that might have been there, they're, especially with their proximity to the coast, they probably would have had seafood as a part of this feast as well. Absolutely. Um Things that, you know, other historians on this topic have floated as probably being featured dishes at this first meal would have been mussels, lobsters, grapes, plums, corn, other venison, vegetables. Venison like that. Venison as well. Yeah. Uh, other types of fowl because there would have been ducks and, and other birds around as, uh, all over the place. Much different than potentially what we imagine in our minds the first Thanksgiving. And I think Plymouth, was. and, and I, ha- I have to, to correct Plymouth Plantation, they now have um, a, a new name. It's Plymouth, and I cannot remember the second part of it. I apologize for that. But they do some explorations with t- the food that would have possibly been eaten as a part of that um, uh, Thanksgiving. Gotcha. Well, let's, uh, let's shift gears for a second and talk about um, something a little bit more close to home, and that's you know, Thanksgiving in the Hall County region yes. of Nebraska. Um, are there any special traditions that were unique to this part of the country with this holiday? I have not found anything particular. By the time we get to the settlement uh, uh, of, um, uh, or the later period, uh, I was able to look at some of the 1880s newspapers. Well, actually, there was hundreds of hits that came up for Thanksgiving and, and looking for things, and, and I was only kind of honed in on a couple of them. I have uh, a whole page of things that are related to Thanksgiving from an 18, the 30th of November 
1876 Grenolin Times, and, and there's different things that talk to, there's poems, there is, um, there's uh, things about the old-fashioned Thanksgiving. The tale is retold probably hundreds of thousands of times in newspapers across the country about the first Thanksgiving. And so they, they go into that and the relationship uh, with religion and all of that. And there's uh, a number of religious readings and poems. And then even um, uh, one that's one of the stories in this particular issue was Miss Crockett's Chicken Pie, a Thanksgiving story. Uh, so I did not take the time to read it as it is very long. And I printed that in very small print. Uh, in the 1880s, 1888, uh, well, first 1884, here is Thanksgiving Ball at Wood River, Nebraska, and the, uh, other various items of interest that occurred. So uh, a lot of the smaller com communities would get together and hold a ball. Even Grand Island was holding a Thanksgiving ball. The Lions Post at GAR would oh. hold a Thanksgiving ball uh, uh, one of those evenings. It, it was even then, I think they recognized its proximity to the unofficial holiday of Christmas and, and kind of tying into a celebration season. It was also winter, and they were looking for things to do. But they, they were talking in the Wood River paper about the party that got together and uh, the ladies and gentlemen that came from all of the surrounding communities to go to Wood River to this ball. Uh, and then in 1888... Uh, it's. I find it fascinating to to look at the advertisements in there. Um, sure. Not only did they advertise the Thanksgiving ball at the JAR Hall, and Bartling's band played for that, by the way, but uh, and this was this was promoted a lot uh, to buy your oysters from Dylan Houston. They also had on hand uh, fresh candies, hickory nuts, chestnuts, walnuts, and all kinds of nuts for the table. Don't forget the poor and needy. At Thanksgiving, uh, turkeys, chickens, um, uh, ducks, geese to be ha uh, had dressed or alive by John Reese, and the annual Thanksgiving service uh, would be held at the Opera House. Uh, and this paper was dated the 29th of November in 1888. Uh, it also had what to eat on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving breakfast they recommended deviled oysters on toast, watercress salad fried chicken, cream sauce, baked sweet potatoes, tomato omelet, and Malaga crepes. I do not know what that is. Then for dinner, they recommended stewed oysters. Oysters were very popular. Apparently. Broiled smelts. Uh, I don't even know what that is. Uh, smelt is a fish. Okay. Broiled, smelt. though. Bro broiled. Yeah. Broiled. It. Yeah, broiled <laughs> smelts. Uh, and a sauce maitre de hotel, uh, Parisian potatoes, squirrel pot pie. Great. Um, lobster style, uh, stewed cauliflower, roast turkey, cranberry sauce, celery, mayonnaise, fruit cake, uh, lady fingers, pumpkin pie, mince pie, cheese, assorted nuts, and fruits. And then they had... Um, uh, they always had these caricatures uh, in a lot of them about uh, usually a turkey in either an alive or dead state uh, on uh, some of the cartoons. Uh, and then the last one that I got from about the same time was the at the GA Haw GAR Hall, they were serving a Thanksgiving dinner. The meats included roast turkey, and these are the hot meats, with cranberry sauce, chicken with sausage, cold, boiled ham, roast beef, Breads were Boston brown bread, white bread, and buns. Vegetables included potatoes without jackets, oh. uh, squash, beans, cabbage, slaw, and celery. Dessert included plum pudding, mince, apple, and pumpkin pie. And the extras were cake, donuts, and apples, served with tea and coffee from 11 to 3 at the GAR Hall. Oysters, squirrels, and... Yeah. Geese, I, oh my! <laughs> yeah, well, and and this is just this is just a couple of years. The, there are all kinds of. Th I didn't even look into the 1890s as things got, as we became more developed community, we were able to bring more and more things in, and even during the lean times of the mid 1890s, you have the reminder to not forget the poor. 
So these are things that carry through from the beginning, even today. Look at what we do at the Salvation Army here, serving all the meals to the people who are, uh, are not able to provide a Thanksgiving meal uh, for their families. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's still going on today all over the country. Well, that's definitely one thing that's endured since this time, the 19th century to the present, is that outreach to the public in various you know, charitable organizations and, and, and such. Um, has there any, have there been any significant changes since the period that we interpret here at Stern Museum to the present? The only thing I can think of is probably, you know, the, unfortunately the commercialism that's, yeah. that's been associated I with it. I think that that's probably the <laughs> biggest thing is the commercialization of, it. it's not really, it's kind of like the skip over holiday yeah. That occurs, oh, here's when the Christmas season starts uh, with Thanksgiving. And so, which I find very sad. I think Thanksgiving on its own uh, it is a standalone. Uh, it's nice to, even if you want to ignore the whole misconceptions around the first Thanksgiving, it's nice to have a day that we um, can give thanks uh, for our family, our friends, for our fortunes, and to also remember the people who do not have as much as we have and try to always help them out as well. Absolutely. Um, the thing that I like about this podcast the most is just being able to to dive into these things. I, you know, the community that we have here at Stern Museum has an interest in them. And I, I feel like I found my own little work family of people who appreciate these little tidbits and insights into history, especially events like Thanksgiving. You know, it's not just a date on the calendar where you get some food. There's been countless individuals involved in, you know, making this holiday what it is. And it's changed and it's it's been one thing and it's been something completely different in another community. And those are the sorts of stories that I like to highlight. Yeah, that, that, and that's how it originally started out. There was no one set day for some of the, you know, in the Eastern states, each state kind of had their own day that was kind of like an, an unofficial Thanksgiving day. Uh, and it wasn't until it became an official holiday that it was designated. And of yeah. course, there's the, there's the jumping around of Thanksgiving on the calendar too that happened until it was always determined to be a, this specific yeah, on Thursday, and, and even so. the original Thanksgiving in quotation marks in 1621, we have no idea when it was. It was exactly. sometime between late September and late November. Yeah, you know, it, it was. Just, it was probably a give thanks for harvest, and that's all they viewed it as. You know, uh, hindsight being 2020, you tend to write about things and kind of uh, um, look fondly. Uh, you know, maybe not remembering all the necessarily poor things, but just remembering all the, the good stuff and writing about that. And uh, um, that's one of the things that, that gets carried forward. Absolutely. Well, we will leave it there. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking with Chris, Chris Hochstetler, rather, and Bonnie Smith. So stick with us and we'll be back after these words. Today's podcast is brought to you by Nebraska Midlands Railroad. People who wish to go to Omaha, Chicago, or points beyond, who want fast time and the most superior train service, will do well to consider traveling the Nebraska Midlands Railroad. Our lowest standard fare is available now. See the agent at the depot in Railroad Town. Welcome back to another episode of the Stir Crazy Podcast. I am here with Executive Director Bonnie Smith from the Stir Museum Foundation and Executive Director Chris Hoxhetler from the Stir Museum proper. Thank you both for being on the podcast. Thank you for having us, Rob. Thank you, Rob. It's good to be here again. Yeah. So the, the topic of conversation today is going to be a little bit different than in episodes past. We are going to take a minute to kind of reflect on the situation that we're all experiencing because this is the season of giving thanks and thinking of others and all of those sorts of relevant topics. So both of you are in a very unique situation nationally in that, you know, of all the industries that have in, been impacted by the COVID-19 epidemic, nonprofits are one that maybe hasn't been on 
that many radars um, comparative to the rest of the country. So I thought I, it would be interesting to just kind of talk to both of you about what it's been like to manage such institutions under these circumstances. So my first question, and you know, feel free either of you to answer, what, what has been the most difficult part of directing your institutions during such a situation as this COVID-19 epidemic? Honestly, this year started and Chris and I came together as a team um, to collaborate and make certain that we were able to sustain all of the different problems, issues, um, opportunities that came up throughout this year. COVID-19 has certainly presented some significant challenges. As Chris and I looked at the year and looked at closing in March to the public, we looked to ways where we could continue to engage our constituency, continue to engage our donors. Um, Chris has done a phenomenal job coming on board in February, hitting the ground running, um, having to close the, the museum. Um, it was a heartbreaking for all of us. But really what, what I've seen as um, maybe one of our opportunities is that really Chris and I have worked together throughout. We've been open, we've been honest, and, um, and we've had some incredible team members working alongside us, um, incredible donors, incredible board members, um, making certain that we're riding the ship. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Bonnie has said. It's, uh, it's an interesting environment to operate in. It's, um, you know, I guess I would start by saying that nonprofits just historically in America are, are incredibly resilient. They just have been. Uh, you know, you go back in, in history, if we can do that here on the Stuart Crazy podcast. And, Absolutely welcome. <laughs> and, and kind of peel back what de Tocqueville said about America in general was really, in my mind, the bedrock of of nonprofit history here in this in in this country. And that was paraphrasing that he he found it curious that Americans from all walks of life would come together and they would come together and form groups that would solve social issues in communities. And he he found that to be very curious. Well, if you peel that back a little bit, that's what nonprofits do. We come together, we provide services, we we deal with social issues, economic issues, and that's why it's become such a strong sector, a str uh, an essential sector in America and how America actually functions. And I think that is decidedly American. And it's been very resilient through the years, through any number of catastrophes and situations and wars and now pandemics as well. Uh, and it's stayed strong to that. But what I've found particularly difficult, I guess, uh, through this is, you know, the pursuit of staying relevant as a museum because we're a place that's based on interaction solely. I mean, that's what our purpose is, is, is to interact with people. And when you, when we entered into this pandemic, you know, as a team together and, and, and to Bonnie's point, we sat down and said, well, what's going to happen when we have to close to the public, you know, we knew that we had to do something that, that would keep that relevancy and that engagement with people. And so the staff and, and board really responded well. Boards, uh, the two organizations, boards responded well and really embarked on what I think is a pretty robust adventure of creating virtual opportunities as well as safe opportunities on the campus here for people to actually come to once we could get open. Yeah. But it's been challenging. It's been difficult. There's no question. Absolutely. And, you know, both of you kind of I think spoke a little bit to what my next question is, um, just to kind of give it a little context. The American Alliance of, of Museums, um, a part of Stir Museum, which is a, a part of, conducted a survey of 760 U.S. museums and found that upwards of a, a full third of them were either at risk or significantly at risk of shutting permanently as a result of the pandemic. And I, I my question was going to be how you know, how has Stir Museum managed to weather the storm, if you will, where so many others haven't, unfortunately? I think Bonnie and I'll flip-flop back and forth on mm -hmm. these, but I, I think that not to be accusatory or, 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 uh, or to paint with too broad of a stroke, but historical institutions are steeped in tradition. And sometimes I think that can be an albatross, you know, around your neck or, sure. or a millstone that kind of pulls you to the bottom because 
nostalgia and tradition are good as long as it doesn't stifle innovation. And, you know, I, I think that some of the organizations um, that are facing this challenge and, and, and may succumb to it are organizations that struggle to innovate. You know, when you're faced with such a thing like a pandemic, it's like you have to innovate else you will succumb to it. And historical institutions are per particularly susceptible to that because we're rooted in living in the past. Yeah. My contention is that that roots in the past is only as relevant as you can make it to functions now as well as in the future. There has to be a through line story in everything that we do that keeps us forward looking, that is not just a passive experience where you reflect on the past and say, okay, well, this happened, the Spanish flu happened in 1918. Well, what are the lessons from the Spanish flu? And how can they be applied today? And how can they be applied for the future pandemics that we will face? And I think that Stewart Museum has, one of the reasons Stewart Museum has weathered this well is that there was a, 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 a true willingness to innovate when I came in February and I met with, uh, you know, met with Bonnie for not the first time. We, we'd been friends before I got here, but there was a willingness to sit down and ask hard questions of each other and say, how can we innovate our way through this? And to this point, I think we've done a pretty fair job of that. I agree completely with what Chris has said. And I would say that from a fundraising um, perspective, when you look at the history of the Stewart Museum, when you look at how our community views us, how our community values us, in 1967, when the Stewart Museum was, um, was created, was built, our community embraced this museum as a gem, the gem that it is, a national treasure. And, um, and so they wanted to make sure that we had finances to sustain Stir Museum, not just today, tomorrow, but well into the future. And so our county board is, um, is supportive of our efforts. Chris um, went before the county board and talked to the county board about what we do and why it's important, why it's imperative that we continue our work. And the county board embraced that. And thank goodness that they did. Our community embraces our work. We, um, our fundraising campaigns throughout the year have been terrific. We've had the support of the community because they know that what we do is important because they know that sharing our collective history, sharing and preserving who we are um, and who we've been and where we've been um, is absolutely important. Um, so I really feel like our community deserves a lot of credit for helping us sustain. Um, and by that community, I mean not just the community members in the four county area, but also across the nation. We have donors that will come to Stir Museum, they'll visit, and they'll become lifelong patrons. We're incredibly thankful for that. And this is the season of giving. Um, the, the next question I, I have for both of you is, if, is there anything that you would encourage members of the community, wherever they are, wherever they might be listening, to? Uh, to do in order to help some of these institutions who are struggling, especially during this time. It looks like we're maybe on the horizon of a different year in 2021, thankfully, but it's still gonna be quite a bit of time yet before we get back to any level of normalcy. So would you encourage members of the public to do anything um, other than what they've been doing so far? We have a fantastic community of nonprofit organizations who collaborate more than anywhere I've seen in the United States. These nonprofit organizations are working incredibly hard day and night to make sure that individuals are provided just basic needs. Um, they're making sure that they have food. They are making sure that they have shelter. They're making sure that they have a toy under the tree for Christmas. I would encourage anyone to reach out to one of our fine nonprofits sure. and ask how they can help. It doesn't have to be a monetary gift. Our nonprofits are needing volunteers now more than ever. So I would encourage absolutely every individual to look and see how they can make a difference because absolutely every single person can make a difference in some way. I, I Sometimes I try to imagine a world without nonprofits. Yeah. And it's hard to imagine us as a country without a nonprofit. I mean, just peel that onion back and, and look and see 
how much nonprofits do for our community and for our country, just the healthcare system by itself. All of the hospitals that we receive care at, a good majority of them are nonprofit-based hospitals. They are. I mean, they're, they're institutions that are ran by faith-based organizations, Methodists. That's why it's got a, a Methodist connected to it. There's Catholic hospital systems across this country that are all based in, in nonprofit uh, status. And if you, if you remove those institutions like Stewart Museum or you remove the American Lung Association or the Cancer Society or any of these organizations that do this incredible work, you remove key infrastructure from our country that provides so many services for what we do. And once again, it goes back to what de Tocqueville said. You know, then, then who's left to handle those issues? Well, the government is the only one that's left to handle those issues. So in essence, you remove that power of charting your own course from the people and you imbue it in the government only. And that would be the, ch the course that we would be on if we could imagine a world without nonprofits. Well, what you said earlier is very true, Rob, and I know you quoted um, something from the American Alliance of Museums uh, that, that said, um, you know, a third, nearly a third of museums could close because of the pandemic. Well, it's not just museums. It's, it's also the entire nonprofit sector is yes. facing that. So what I would encourage members of the public to do is to, you know, find, find those organizations that you find to be valuable and invest in them, not just with your, with your dollars. So that's important and every single gift counts. It really does. If you can skip a cup of coffee on the way to work or, you know, something like that and, and give that to a nonprofit, it makes a difference. Trust me, it, it does. It makes a huge difference. But engage with them through your volunteerism as well as your interest like them on Facebook, share a post that they may share, you know, share with your friends that, the, hey, this is an organization that I support. You should look at them. You know, they're doing good things. These are things that mean the world to organizations that are really trying to make a difference in the community and make a huge difference in the community and the country. So I would ask members of the public to do just that. Absolutely. I appreciate, you know, your candor of, of both of you. It's not an easy thing to talk about. And I think everyone's been a little bit COVID fatigued at this time, you know, and that's just the reality of human nature, unfortunately. I appreciate the both of you coming on the podcast and kind of talking about the realities of our present situation. The only other question I would ask is, you know, there has been recent news that there, there may be one or two vaccines possibly ready for distribution early on next year to the, the general public. Maybe we'll see some return to normalcy by the end of next year potentially what sort of big projects on the horizon are you most looking forward to and that can be from foundation side or the museum side yeah well well maybe it's both you know we're we're both partners in this and bonnie and the foundation have been just incredible in moving us forward you know i i don't know how closely the the, pub, the general public watches us I, I presume that there's a core group that that follows us pretty pretty regularly but we've gone through some significant changes during this pandemic. There has been no moss growing under our feet at no. all. Uh, when you look at this campus, you can actually see the physical changes from buildings being moved on this campus to some things that people may not see. We've undergone a, a, a conversion of our entire campus-wide database to put us on one system, including the foundation, so that we can gain efficiencies in revenue generation and you know, changing the visitor experience here on the campus to even just, you know, monitoring certain things that happen here. And we're, we're going to be unveiling a, a new website. Uh, there will also be a new look and feel to Stewart Museum. That's something that Bonnie and I work very closely together on. And all of those really portend a dynamic shift and a change in how, how we interact with the public. And what is our purpose here at Stewart Museum? It's a very active purpose. It's a very joyful, it's a very immersive process. This is not a place where you come to see things. This is a place where you come to do things and Absolutely. experience things. And we, we are going to lead with that. And it is gonna decidedly change a visitor's experience on this campus. So I'm most looking forward to post-pandemic, what that looks like 
in people's faces when they come here and they experience this profound change that has actually been happening during a pandemic. So I, I guess that is what I would probably be the most excited about. I've been thrilled with the changes that we've been able to implement with the updates that we've been able to see through during this time that could have been devastating for us. Um, you know, certainly we want our visitors back on grounds. We want them to be safe first and foremost. So as we all do our part in, um, in curtailing the, the pandemic and the spread, um, you know, we, we are looking forward to an amazing 2021 where we're able to bring our farm to table back. Our farm to table dinner that the first year we, um, we facilitated it um, sold out the month before we had it, we held it. Um, so the foundation is looking forward to seeing people. We're, we're looking forward to engaging with people, connecting with people um, mm -hmm. on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But certainly we're, we're most excited about showing off all of the work that our talented teams have been doing during this time. Whether it's the uh, technology that put us in perfect alignment for pulling the trigger on our virtual programming, including the podcasts that we're doing today. Absolutely. Um, or whether it's the many things that Chris mentioned um, that we've worked on together. Um, we're excited to show you that we have a new store in store. Well, we spoke on the, uh, on the museum side of things. Is there anything that either of you are personally thankful for during this, this holiday season? I know it's uh, kitschy and <laughs> maybe a little eye roll worthy, but I think this is time to uh, really take stock of, of those types of things. So I will, I will leave it to you to both answer. I think that's a terrific question. I don't think it's kitschy at all. <laughs> um, I've actually spent a considerable amount of time thinking about all of the ways that I'm thankful and grateful. Um, I am thankful for collaboration. Um, I'm thankful for Chris. I'm thankful that we're able to um, move mountains together. I am thankful for our Heartland community and their incredible generosity that allows us to keep doing our work. Um, I'm incredibly thankful to our healthcare workers and front on the front lines as well as the leaders and administrators. My niece is, um, is a PA and she works in the COVID clinic. I'm thankful for her. I'm thankful that every day she goes to work, she has to don um, an N95 mask and, um, and all of this paraphernalia that's so incredibly uncomfortable that she doesn't eat all day or drink all day, but she cares for individuals who need her help. I am also um, thankful for our nonprofits. I mentioned that earlier. I'm incredibly thankful to the Stern Museum and Foundation team and boards. We have such incredibly talented individuals that are so incredibly passionate about what we do. Yeah, that's hard to that's hard to match. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm a I'm a pretty simple guy and you know, I kind of boil things down to relationships. That's the most important thing that we have in this world is each other. As people, you know, the team here at Stream Museum, Bonnie as a as a contemporary and a colleague, you know, I never thought that I'd have to necessarily navigate a global pandemic in my lifetime, but it's yeah. nice to be able to have a contemporary like Bonnie by my side. Uh as we as we do that together as leaders of, of organizations that that serve the same mission the same cause but i look at those relationships that are kind of amassed through the years and how we steward them and how we take care of them and i think that that is what i'm most thankful for and i would offer that up to anybody yeah sure we're in a pandemic but remember what's important to you is the people around you you know don't don't let this thing eat away at us uh don't let it eat away at your relationships uh, be grateful for one another uh, and express that gratitude freely. It's, it's, it's uh, liberating when you do that, when you can ex express that gratitude. And this is the time of year that is most perfect for that. There are a lot of people out there who are going to experience a lot of loss uh, and have experienced a lot of loss through this pandemic. We've lost members of our community uh, due to this. Um, now is a good time to, to take a moment and pause and remember what's most important in all this, and that's each other. So spend that time with each other, even if it's over a, a phone call or a Zoom or a text, and just let people know how much you care about them. Absolutely. I'm thankful that the both of you had the time and your schedules to be on the podcast this morning. 
So with, with that, I think we can leave it there. Bonnie Smith, Chris Hochstetler, thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. This concludes another episode of the Stir Crazy Podcast. I had fun today, Mike. I think this was a very interesting episode if you care about cultural institutions like museums. And I think caring about those is something that people should do. I want to go out on a crazy limb and say that uh, museums are important and museums should be supported. And man, what a controversial statement, huh? Yeah, all nonprofits in general, though. This is the season, you know, especially under all the circumstances going on this year, to really just kind of take stock of what matters to you and what you hope comes back even stronger next year in a post-COVID world. Absolutely. So are those... Do you hear that? Do you hear those bells in the back? I don't hear them. What are we talking about? <laughs> next next week, we are finishing out season three. Wow. This is going to be our 18th episode of the Stuart Crazy Podcast. We are closing out with a, a big talk about Christmas. Yes. And yeah, it's going to be, there's a lot to say about it. Yes. History of Christmas is very, you know, rich indeed, especially in America, but all over the world, really. It, it has become so many different things over so many different generations. And, uh, we're going to be speaking with the curatorial staff and also the interpretive staff here at Stir Museum about some of the different forms that Christmas has taken over the years, especially in the Nebraska region. Absolutely. In the meantime, I hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving and I am thankful to everyone who listens. Same, same for me.